Yeah. Just yeah. waiting for the, there's two more people, two or three more people. Yeah, there's three. Um, just be so they, we can. You know what? What I'm going to do, first of all, is uh, I'll start. I've got some housekeeping items that I just want to mention before we get into uh, the Noonan family, and we're so lucky to have them here uh, with us this evening, considering um, the marathon that they have been on <coughs> for the past, well, for years, but specifically for the past 30 days, 35 days. Um, and I'll let you, they'll tell you their odyssey on that one. But um, at any rate, thanks for coming tonight. And first of all, I'd like to say that we've changed our name. A lot of people uh, used to know us as the Boston Alzheimer's Center. And we have gone back to the original name of the house, which is Rogerson House. And we are still taking care of folks with uh, memory uh, problems. So just want to let you know that. And um, that's number one. Number two is we have um, tonight's program is going to be webcast on channel two. So that what we're filming here this evening will be shown as soon as Paula gets the uh, video back to me, we'll get it to channel two. And when you go on to their computer site, if you've got the right accoutrements for your computer, you can hook into um, the, the site and you can watch the lecture that we're going to be fortunate enough to hear this evening. The other thing is, uh, wanted to let you know for, for folks who are keeping notes, that the next lecture, this is the first of this year, we're into our fourth year, and the next lecture is going to be on Thursday, February 26th, which will feature Kirk Daphner from the Brigham. And he's going to be doing what we normally do, is have a document to give an annual update on what's the latest in research and treatments of Alzheimer's disease. And then in March, on March uh, Wednesday, Wednesday now as opposed to a Thursday evening, March 31st, I feel uh, very fortunate enough because this is a problem that's been bugging me for a couple of years. And we just saw it in the paper the other day, which is uh, Alzheimer's in Down syndrome patients. Yeah, and uh, Dr. Florence Lai, Lai, L-A-I, who is on staff both at Mass General and also at McLean's, is going to be coming and sharing that with us. And then we have Dr. Barry Reesberg, who will be coming in May, who is one of the top docs who's been working with Memantine, and he will share his thoughts with us on that. And then uh, the final one that I have scheduled, one I don't have scheduled yet, but another really good one is in here, this topic, which I'm sure you folks can, and many in the room can appreciate, compassion fatigue, which is Donna White, who is an addiction specialist from Lemuel Shattuck Hospital and talks about all of the things that caregivers go through. And when you're loving somebody that much and then getting that tired. So that's that. And then one final thing that I want to mention is that uh, this year we have, we had a conference symposium that we had sponsored in October. And um, from that, um, there was a gentleman by the name of Dr., um, and I knew I was going to forget his name, Martin Prince, who is a doctor from London, who is the head of Alzheimer's Disease International's 1066 program, which is dealing with Alzheimer's in developing countries. And we are now collaborating with them in sending them, with all the tapes that we do from the lecture series and all the, also the symposiums we've uh, presented, we are sending them over 60 videotapes that will be used in places like India, China, um, Africa, and Latin America. So, at any rate, I think that's the update on what's going on here. And I would now like to, and there's not much I'm going to say here, because what can I say? A lot of us, practically everybody in the room saw the show last week, but forget it. And um, thank you. From all of us, thank you. That was not an easy thing to do, to get up there um, and pour your heart out. And so from everybody, please, um, thanks for doing that. 
the folks who are here tonight are John Noonan, Patty Noonan Barbado, Julie Noonan Lawson, Eric Noonan, and Malcolm Noonan. So, Patty, thank you for coming. Thank you. It's a privilege. It's a hard privilege, but it's a privilege. You agonize over how to say and what to say. Uh, I'm Patty. 59 years old, I'm the third oldest and the family historian. For simplicity, we will often call Alzheimer's disease AD. Because of this illness evokes so much pain in my life, I need to read this. My mom was a vibrant, fun-loving woman who loved people and life. She laughed often and enjoyed having a big family. There were 10 of us. We would pack the car for a day at the beach and sing all the way. There was always room for one more at the dinner table. Mom forgot when I was a teenager, and then she forgot more and more. We used to laugh when she called us by the wrong name or forgot that she had just disciplined one of us. In February 1964, our youngest brother, Eric, was born. We were thrilled with a new little guy to love. We easily slid into the routine of a new baby. All of us older children helped a lot around the house, and it wasn't hard for us all to take turns with a late night bottle or an early morning feeding. I was 20 years old. Mom didn't seem to recover as quickly after giving birth. It must have been that she was 40 years old. She loved babies, but she was depressed. We couldn't understand it. The doctor called it postpartum depression and put her on an antidepressant. That year, Eric was newborn, Bob was two, Julie was six, John was 10, Butch 13, Fran 15, Kathy 17, my oldest sister Maureen was 21. So there was quite a house full of people, children. <coughs> Gradually, Mom became more depressed, had difficulty making Dad's lunch, putting the coffee pot together, even though she'd done it thousands of times, and organizing meals. My dad was overwhelmed. He took her to doctor after doctor. Not one could find the cause. In the spring of 1967, Mom had a series of shock treatments, and then in the summer, another series of shock treatments. She went to my sister Maureen's house to recuperate after the treatments. I had Eric living with me on and off during the summer. By fall, my sister Julie, age nine, came to live with me, and that was supposed to be temporary. Julie would not have to change schools if she came to live with me. We then had five people in our little four-room apartment, Julie, age nine, a two-year-old daughter, and a newborn baby, and I was 23 years old. In December 1967, Dad was desperate, and Mom was admitted to St. Elizabeth's Hospital for tests. It was the week before Christmas, and Dad and I heard the heartbreaking news that Mom had a very rare disease called Alzheimer's, and Mom would gradually lose her mind and would die within five to eight years. Shortly after that, we started to explain to doctors and nurses what Alzheimer's disease was. At different times, Fran and Kathy quit their jobs and took turns staying home with their younger children. Eventually, Dad hired people to help as Mom couldn't be left alone. My dad then spent his days juggling work, house, mom sitters, kids, and eventually hospitals and nursing homes. He was a firefighter with a large family and little money. Needless to say, there was chaos. When she was in the institution, Dad would cook supper, supervise the cleanup, go visit her, and then she would cry and beg to be taken home. She was lonely, confused, extremely depressed, and easily agitated. She was upset when he visited and upset when he didn't visit. When he got home, he would go into his bedroom. After a while, he'd come out and his face all red from crying. Feelings and pains were never discussed. We were all in the survival mode. While writing this, again, I am moved with compassion towards my dad and what he had to go through. In the early 1970s, Mom was bedridden and non-responsive. She was at Foxborough State Hospital at that time. I received a call from a nurse that Mom was doing poorly. When I met with the doctor, he told me that he was putting her on IV as she was dehydrated. I then told the doctor that we didn't want any extraordinary means taken to keep her alive. He yelled at me, I can't kill her, you know. With tears and faltering words, I explained that I was not asking for him to do that at all. 
And that was my introduction to end-of-life choices. The five to eight years predicted turned into 11 years. With the last five years, mom being in a fetal position, in a bed, being spoon-fed. Most of my siblings were brought out, up without their mom, and, and dad was preoccupied with her illness and trying to double pain. One of the hardest parts of the disease is the personality changes that happened. Forgetting starts first, then depression, then an inability to cope with life and relationships. I remember how hurt my mom would get that a friend would say or do something. She could no longer feel the love from the friend and ignore the little hurts. They were big hurts, and she began to withdraw and criticize and became very paranoid. In the 1990s, I then experienced the same things with Fran. Fran lived with me before she was married, and I was the matron of honor at her wedding. She began to write me some very strange things and accuse me of wrongs, and I was devastated. I would send notes of apology, and I lovingly sent notes of encouragement to be kind and reach out to her. I am very grateful to say that in therapy she continued to sort, and she did remember how supportive I was to her, especially during mom's illness. After the Alzheimer's disease was apparent, I began to put this AD puzzle together. John will be speaking about Fran's illness. Maureen and Dick lived in New York. While they were visiting one time, I said something that offended Maureen, and she started sending me these awful letters and accusing me of things that happened when we were teenagers. Maureen and I had been roommates and best friends when we were growing up. We always double dated. After our marriages, our families were inseparable. In 1989, she refused to come to our 25th wedding anniversary. In 1992, Maureen's husband, Dick, finally came to us and he said, I don't know what's wrong with Maureen and how sad I am at her choices. By the mid-90s, Maureen's teenagers were very upset by their mom's lack of memory and her behavior. Dick finally took her for testing for AD and she was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. That explained the destruction that was happening with our relationship. Dick did everything he could to keep life normal for them. The teens left home, and Dick made sure she had important things to do during the day and people to interact with. When he wasn't working, they were inseparable. Maureen was an EMT, but her condition gradually made it impossible to continue. In December of 1999, Dick went back to driving the ambulance so Maureen could at least ride in the ambulance to continue being part of the squad. His stress level was extreme, with round-the-clock care. One night he came home after an ambulance run, and he died of a heart attack. During the funeral time, Maureen's children wanted someone by her side constantly. I volunteered. The disease had progressed so much that she forgot that she'd been upset with me. And she was relieved for the help and the comfort I gave her. The children hadn't had a chance to grieve their dad's death and were in a crisis about what to do with mom. The two girls moved to Oregon to be with their brothers and bring Maureen to live there. Those precious nieces and nephews did all in their power to follow their parents' plans for their mom's final days. They agonized about her care at numerous family meetings through each stage of the disease. They kept her nearby, first in a separate apartment, and then taking turns spending nights with her. She went to a daycare during the day. Maureen finally was placed in a facility. Then she decided not to get out of bed and often wouldn't eat. The nursing home started to force feed her. Her directive said no spoon feeding. They found a facility that would not force feed Maureen and they moved her there. The room was filled with pictures and mementos of her life and her favorite music. She had overnight visits from her children and grandchildren. My nieces and nephews asked me to come as Maureen asked for me, and they knew that Maureen had been hurt by me. I was at peace with Maureen, but they didn't feel she was. When I walked into the room, Maureen said my name with a big smile, and she cried after I left that evening. The next day, my niece Karen asked me to talk to Mom about the hurts. I prayed about how to do this. She didn't have that many words. When I entered the room, she was so excited to see me again, and she cried. I, 
I again apologized for the hurts that I had caused her, and that I also told her that I forgave her for the hurts she caused me. Later that day, her condition changed, and she was no longer responsive. The children felt that she was waiting for me. I spent five days loving Maureen and her wonderful children. She died a few days after I left in November of 2001. A week later, as we gathered for Maureen's funeral, we were in anguish. We grieved Maureen's death, and we grieved her long illness and all the heartbreak through the illness. And then we grieved the disease and the loss of our mom. We also grieved our future, knowing that we would have many repeats of this devastation. I am so grateful to God that I apologized for the hurts I caused my sisters but that I didn't get resentful and remove myself from a relationship with them or retaliate. This disease is more than a memory robber. I'm sure so many of you know that. It's a destroyer of relationships. Alzheimer's has broken our hearts many times. Alzheimer's disease has been impacting our lives since the early 1960s, and it's 2004. At a very young age, our children were taught how to take care of themselves and to be independent, to make their lunches and do laundry and other chores. Along with speaking like this, I will do anything to raise awareness of this dreadful disease. I shared my introduction to end life choices with my mother, but as a family, we've had many discussions about what kinds of intervention we would want during a terminal illness. What are the things we need at our bedside if we're on our last days? Do we want music? What are the things that would, would soothe us? We have partnered with Sally Callahan and others in participating in day-long conferences regarding end-of-life choices. Respecting choices is values clarification, ethics, and decision-making for end-stage Alzheimer's patients. It's a conference for family members and professionals that offer CEUs. During the day, participants are invited to examine their own attitudes about their lives' ends and how to deal compassionately with patients and their families. In the mid-90s, all of us siblings gave our blood for testing. Our genetic results are known at the National Institute of Health. Our extended family is involved in a blind study there. Every year, we go for cognitive testing, blood tests, MRIs of our brains, and lumbar punctures. This is a nerve-wracking, emotional time, with AD being right up in our faces every second. Year-round, I work on the memory ride, at times to exhaustion, to raise funds for research. Eric will be speaking about the memory ride. All over the world, doctors are working on different areas of research. AD is considered to be an old person's disease. And they must die of something. But it doesn't have to be like that. We need to fund research and allow people the dignity of having their minds when their bodies wear out. When we were growing up, we often went to Dad and showed him a sore foot or a sore finger. He would examine the sore foot and tell us, walk on it. <laughs> and it would get better. That's a parent's thing. But that was Dad's silent mode of life. And I think it was the times, too. Just walk on it. Don't feel, don't complain, ignore the pain, and that helped him survive. When I first heard that Fran had AD, I was devastated. This was the worst nightmare of my life, and it was happening again. Dad told me that I had to get over this. I told him, I will never get over this. I said, Dad, this is breaking my heart. I know a God that loves me. I have a wonderful husband and beautiful children but I will never get over this. God has taught me many things. Through life's journeys, I have gradually changed how I deal with pain, but I refuse to be stuck in the pain. I grieve continually. Just thinking about AD, the AD destroyer, fills my heart and my eyes with tears that are always leaking out. But I am integrating the joys and the sorrows. I am in tears and heartbreak, and then I am experiencing the exhilaration of the blessings of my life. I laugh more, I express thanks, 
and experience peace. I take more time to smell the roses, walk the beach, and enjoy creation. I've always been one to want to make memories, and I want to make more with my husband, children, and eight grandchildren. I compliment when I see the beauty in others, and I support people by sending notes of encouragement. I make an effort to relate to my nieces and nephews as often as possible. And I so treasure these, my very precious siblings. We are very different but I have a, such a respect and admiration for each. I think it's a miracle that we have survived all the garbage and heartbreak and destruction of Alzheimer's disease, and we still have good relationships with each other. We have fun together. We work at it continually. In October 2001, my sister Kathy called from North Carolina and said, Kathy, I have metastasized cancer in my spine, but at least it's not Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. We cried together and prayed on the phone. Getting AD, not cancer, was surely her worst and our worst nightmare. Kathy died seven weeks later, the same day that Maureen died in August. A couple years ago, I went through a lot of family stress, and I forgot some major things. I began to fear that I was experiencing the symptoms of AD. I was terrified. I was traveling down a thought process that was consuming me, and I decided to more fully pursue my relationship with God, the God that loves me and created me. With the help of a friend, I began to search the scriptures more. She helps me to see that I was like Job when he said, what I feared has come upon me, what I dreaded has happened to me. The Psalms are a beautiful invitation to integration. And I so am comforted by the variety of feelings expressed. From the depths of despair to the heights of worship and thanksgiving, the writers express their feelings to God and man. And I surely can identify with these writers. At times I'm experiencing Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. And I pour out my heart to my God. And I feel no comfort. And at other times I'm experiencing the feelings expressed in Psalm 34. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. In order to keep from getting depressed, I am memorizing some of the Psalms. It has helped tremendously. I am continually experiencing more peace and more of God's love for me. Last June, after doing our cognitive testing at NIH, Peter and I did genetic counseling. And after a very exhausting and emotional 24 hours as we contemplated this, I did decide to find out if I had the gene. Tears of relief flowed as the doctor told me I do not have the gene. Mm -hmm. that, my, that means that my children can't have that gene either. Good. And I thank God for this. Thank you. child born of Julia, Julia Noonan. I was in junior high school. I was a junior in high school when my mother started to get sick. We did not know what was wrong with her. She started seeing doctors in Boston. The house was always in chaos. It was hard to watch my father trying to take care of mom. He was working full time as a fireman and also two part time jobs in Stoughton where we lived. I was a sophomore in high school when my mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. I, I felt like an in, invisible member of the family. Even though my sisters and brothers were there, I did not feel a part of the family. My mother's illness created a situation where I could disappear from everybody and I became a loner at school. Today I realize how hard it was for my father to support 10 kids and keep his sanity. When my mother became sick, I spent a lot of time with my sister Maureen working at the family-owned pizza store. During my high school years, the family changed drastically. 
My mother was in Boston weekly, and we were on our own. I stayed at my Aunt Pat's house. She was my mother's older sister and lived right down the street. She had eight children of her own. It was hard staying there with all her kids. I felt like I didn't belong anywhere. There was very little information about AD at the time. Mom was diagnosed. My sister Kathy came up with information about early onset. She told me that each child of our mother had a 50% chance of dying from the same disease. This information only increased my feelings of being alone. Relatives and friends were unable to offer support on this unknown monster. My mother was in and out of hospitals and eventually never returned to our home. As time progressed, I put the illness out of my mind and went about my adult life. The family was no longer close and we went separate ways. After Alzheimer's entered my family again, I started to look for research studies the family could become involved with. I felt hopeless and this was a way of helping that feeling. Around 1990, while working at McLean Hospital in Belmont, I started doing all kinds of research at McLean's library and attempted to talk with research doctors there to see about volunteering for, for projects. The doctors did not have any need for us at that time, even though we had two sisters with early onset Alzheimer's disease. I then began calling all over the United States to doctors I, I found that were publishing information on the disease. I was having little success in becoming involved with research. Eventually I made contact with research doctors at Massachusetts General Hospital and now we all work with several doctors on the East Coast. As time went on, I worried about my memory and how I was thinking. I started having organizational problems and would forget about returning or following up on contacts I had made regarding research. I asked my sister Julie to take this responsibility on. Through the years, we became involved with the National Institute of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. We have been have since been informed which gene caused Alzheimer's disease in our family. And I have come to learn that I carry the gene which causes Alzheimer's in our family. I now have an official diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, and as of December 31st, 2003, I'm no longer able to work as a licensed mental health counselor. The genetics of early AD continue to haunt our family. We are now coming to the time when our children are entering the prime of their lives and they face the uncertainty of their future. The emotions of our children being hurt are the most difficult part that I deal with today. I, I get nervous when I talk, so I wrote mine also. <laughs> The effects of living with Alzheimer's disease. Where do I start when most of your life has been with Alzheimer's disease? My name is John Noonan. I am the seventh child of Julia and John Noonan. It was around 1967 when my dad found out my mom would not get better, would get worse, and eventually would die from this disease. This was the first time I saw my dad cry. I was 12 years old and seeing my father cry scared me. My mother had the disease for many years. When I was about 15, I went to see her in a nursing home. She asked me who I was as I stood at her bed. I never visited her again. I regret that decision now, but at the time, I was devastated. For many years, I did not have to deal with Alzheimer's disease. Then came Fran, Maureen, and now Malcolm Butch. Let me share with you about living with AD from this point of view. I could stand here and talk to you about end-of-life issues or death and dying because all of these issues are so intertwined with each other. But I'll try to focus on my sister Fran. Fran, my sister Fran. Let me give you a brief description of her and who she was. Fran was always spirited and fun-loving. She loved to kid around. She loved to laugh. She was always looking for other ways for other people around her to be happy and light. Fran could get my dad to relax, even if he was upset. Dad was very serious most of the time. So to get him loosened up was going some. 
When my mother got sick, at the age of 17, Fran became caretaker and homemaker for the younger kids in the house. In much the same way as Fran being the lighthearted joker, when she was called upon to take on the role of mother, caretaker, and homemaker, she took this role very serious. So serious, she nearly had a breakdown. Fran went away to rest with relatives that she enjoyed. They happened to live in Hawaii, and when she came back, <laughs> she began to settle down. She went to England to Cape and May Bible College. Eventually, she married Steve. They had met at college. They had two children and settled down just outside Hershey, Pennsylvania, in Lancaster. Steve worked in private practice as a psychiatrist and also for a hospital for mentally challenged individuals. Fran was a stay-at-home mom. She was extremely gifted. In addition to all of the usual mother homemaker jobs, she did all the plumbing, electrical, and carpentry needed around the house. She installed a bathroom. She rewired her home and installed a skylight in her living room. And she built a coffee table with a checkerboard <laughs> built into it. I give you this information because it was so important to keep this in my mind when I saw her. So I would feel at, he, at ease with who she had become. I love being part of my family. I have learned and grown in many ways and continue to do so. Especially when I take on the challenge of sitting down and reflecting and sharing with all of you how my life has been affected by this disease. Friends started a while back to be aggressive with people and hit people in frustration. Fran had been in many nursing homes and care facilities due to this aggressive behavior, and many of the facilities lacked the understanding of how to deal with the aggression. It is my own belief that medications can be adjusted to a point, and at the same time, professional caregivers need to realize not just the patient's needs, but also the caregiver's needs in order to care for the patient. It is a difficult balance that I believe takes a very special and sensitive person. Fran has now passed away. She died December 22nd, 2003. It has been a difficult journey watching her go from a person who could do all to using dry erase boards to help her to remember, to not being able to drive, to not doing much of anything, with the exception of sitting down to visit. She would repeat herself over and over. One thing I forgot to say about Fran is that she had a gift of a soft heart. I could walk into her kitchen, and she would not even have to turn around to look at my way, and she would have a sense of who just walked in and where I was at emotionally. What a gift. I tell you this because even into her late middle stage, this gift had been with her. She knew when someone with a heavy heart was near her. Although she could not understand what was going on, I could see it in her face. When I went to visit Fran with her husband Steve, he was having a hard time with the home Fran was in. They wanted her moved, and it was heavy on his heart. I could see the concern in Fran's face. She would rub his hand with a, and babble with a frown on her face. It took a lot of effort on Steve's part to convince Fran that everything was fine. Even as these types of interactions were going on, Fran could not understand or do anything for herself. Fran had some fruit cut up on the table in front of her. And she was just playing with it and moving it around. It was not until Steve showed her by example that she started to eat it. It was not until this time that I realized that Fran was close, very close to end stage. She had begun to sit more, did not wonder as much, and was tired a lot. Fran got very angry, mad, and frustrated when she went to the bathroom in her diapers. And yet, she did this constantly in her last six months. She shuffled around, going nowhere, and yet going somewhere. At least she knew or sensed she should be doing something. So she got up and moved, and as we walked around, Fran would kind of shuffle, and all of a sudden, she would just stop, point at something, and babble for a minute. She would turn 
and look at me. What I realized is if I had a frown on my face trying to understand what she was saying, she'd be frustrated. If I had a smile and made a positive comment and chuckled, Fran would also chuckle, babble a little more, and move on until she saw something else. I just wanted to sit or lie down and rest. Towards the end, Fran could not do for herself. This was very hard to watch. She did not want to live like this. She had shared with many times no spoon feeding, no antibiotics, no intervention at all. And yet, even though her husband Steve knew this, he could not let her go. And so I watched, and I cried, and I struggled, because I knew what Fran wanted. I bit my tongue and said nothing. I waited and waited and waited for Steve to be able to let her go. In the second week of December, 2003, Julie, Patty, Eric, and myself went down to Pennsylvania to see Fran. We had received a call saying she was not doing well. I made a decision to go down right away. We were told Fran was sleeping with her eyes open, unresponsive, and not eating, and continuing to lose weight. Upon seeing us, she greeted us with a smile. Her heart told her it was good we were there, and she responded to us. She ate some food that Julie fed her. This in itself was a decision to feed her because she did not want to be fed. She smiled. She even seemed to hum along with the songs that we sang. As we visited and as we said goodbye, we told Fran we loved her, and it was okay to go home and be with the Lord. We left the nursing home and met Steve for dinner. Over dinner, we talked about allowing Fran to die. For the first time, Steve acknowledged that he would allow Fran to go and would talk to the nursing home about feeding her and the medication she was on. It makes me wonder if Fran waited to die until she sensed Steve was ready to let go. Fran died the next week. It is painful for all of us to watch. So we share our story and our limited knowledge in hopes it may give you some insight. And you all know that you are not crazy, that others are going through the same thing. In order to do something positive and not feel like victims, in 1997, my brother Eric and I started a bicycle ride to raise money for our research. Eric will talk more about that. I'd like to share, excuse me. I would like to share with you a very small piece of finding out about having or not having a gene for early onset Alzheimer's. I had wanted to know for many years. Seven years ago, I met my present wife Donna. I did not want to get married if I had the gene. It did not matter to her, it did matter to me. But they had not yet determined which gene we carried due to a mix-up at a lab. So we did get married, and two and a half years ago, my sister's blood was retested for the gene. They found the gene. I was overjoyed at this discovery. I wanted to know immediately. I was in the process of setting things up to find out when Maureen and Kathy died. With this kind of stress on my life already, the decision was made by the doctors not to tell me yet. At that point my life, in my life, I was under a tremendous amount of stress. I was forgetting a lot of things which caused me to think I may have Alzheimer's, which caused more stress, which caused me to forget more, which convinced me I had Alzheimer's, <laughs> and so on, and so on, and so on. Even to the point others around me thinking I had Alzheimer's. So in the middle of February, I received a call. I was told I could find out if I had the gene. So in March, I went down to NIH with my wife. We arrived Friday night, did not sleep much. Saturday, we did genetic counseling for about five or six hours. We left there, went back to the hotel. We did not much sleep much again. 
and on Sunday morning, we met with, the doc, with Dr. Trey Sunderland. As we sat across from Dr. Sunderland asked, he asked me in four different ways if I was sure I wanted to know. And my response was yes each time. Dr. Sutherland proceeded to tell me that I did not have the gene. I sat there stunned and did not say anything. This is when Dr. Sutherland told me, this means your kids would not get early onset Alzheimer's. And I wept. I wish I could say that this was the end of the story and they lived happily ever after. But this is not the case. The disease is still taking its toll in my brother Malcolm and into the next generation. We must put an end to this disease now. It is a disease that robs our loved ones from us and us from our loved ones. It is painful for all of us to watch. So I hope that the limited knowledge that we have given you here tonight, or have been able to share with you, is helpful and um, eases that pain a little bit as you deal with your Alzheimer's and your family. So thank you. AD is hard enough to understand when you are an adult. To be born into it is overwhelming. As you've heard from John, Fran was a caretaker for the younger children when our mom became too sick to care for us. Fran was like a mother to me, and her death is too close to me for me to share my experience of living with AD. I have been dealing with sadness and grief since her passing, and even though it is a blessing that Fran has passed, and she, and she is finally free from AD. So instead of speaking to you about my living experience with AD, I want to share with you how I cook today, and how I am proactive in the battle against AD. Eleven months ago, I was worried. No, I was terrified. Every forgotten word or misplaced item or forgotten task sent a charge of terror through me to my core. I was sure that I was going to get Alzheimer's disease. I had stopped living a normal life and started to live as though I was at the edge of a dark journey known as Alzheimer's disease. I decided it was worse for me not to know whether I had the mutated gene that causes AD in my family, than it would be to know the truth and deal with the results, whatever they might be. On my birthday in 2003, I went to NIH to receive my results of genetic testing that I had participated in. After the appropriate counseling, with my partner Scott and my brother John at my side, I was given my results. I do not carry the mutation that causes AD in my family. I sat in stunned silence it was not until I realized that my children would not have to live through the hell that many of us here tonight have to live through, did I cry. I cried with joy for my loved ones and myself, and sobbed for my siblings and other family members that still had to live with the fear and uncertainty, and in some cases, the certainty of Alzheimer's. Before any of us had the opportunity to find out our genetic results, we looked for ways to take back part of our lives. To remove ourselves from being victims of Alzheimer's, if you've been only for a little while. In April of 1997, John and I were sitting in his kitchen deciding what we might do to fight this disease. I had been involved, I had been involved in another organization that held successful fundraisers using bicycle rides. And I asked and John asked if I thought we could do the same. I told him, yes, I suppose we could, but it really is a huge undertaking. That was the end of the discussion. Two months later, while I was raiding John's refrigerator, <laughs> he came home and said to me, so what do we need to do to make this ride happen? Surprised, I responded, oh, you were serious? <laughs> he was. <laughs> we started the memory ride with five riders and a lot of family and friends to support the riders. One sibling laid out a route, another sibling worked on making signs for the riders to follow. 
Another worked on organizing crews at pit stops. Another contacted places for us to use as pit stops. Friends became involved as medical support and massage support. Soon we were ready to go. In 1997, we raised $11,700. It has been seven years, and the Memory Ride has become a successful fundraising event, raising over $575,000. 100% of this money raised by the ride participants has gone to research. Our cost of fundraising is 0%. All of the overhead expenses are covered through the registration fee, corporate sponsorship, and donations from merchants in all three states that the ride now passes through, as well as companies in other states that our volunteer production staff members work for. The production staff at Memory Ride is an all-volunteer group of dedicated people who are touched by the devastation of AD. The staff consists of members of Fortune 500 companies, to owners of their own companies, to just everyday folks who want and need to do something about Alzheimer's. The Memory Ride is a two-day, three-state event from Brattleboro, Vermont, through Keene, New Hampshire, to Boston, Mass. It attracts participants from as far away as Oregon, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Washington, D.C., and this past year we had international riders as well. We are a fully supported ride. Riders and crew are provided with pre-ride support, this being people to connect with for training and fundraising questions or concerns. The riders are required to raise $750 to ride, and the crew is strongly encouraged to raise money as well. We provide a medical team, a massage team for the riders, SAG crew to move gear and support riders on the route. We provide meals on Saturday and Sunday. Riders and crew may take advantage of indoor sleeping accommodations in the Fitchburg High School on Saturday, or they can camp out under the stars in the courtyard. Saturday night accommodations include showers. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you can always make arrangements to travel and stay at local hotels on Saturday evening. The memory ride route is designed by a professional bicyclist to accommodate all levels of skill, and the pit stops provide riders with snacks, water, juice, and fruit. Medical and bicycle tech support, as well as rider support vehicles, roam the route both days to make sure our riders' needs are taken care of. Saturday evening, there is an opportunity to participate in activities. In past years, we have had games, live music, karaoke, presentations from medical professionals, and an opportunity to sit with other participants and share individual experiences about Alzheimer's disease. Sunday, we have a police escort, escorted victory ride into the closing ceremony, where we celebrate with the families and friends of riders and crew the accomplishments of such an incredible event. The 2004 Memory Ride promises to be another successful event. We are anticipating 200 riders this year. The riding field is limited, so please register early <laughs> to reserve your place in this amazing life experience. If riding is not for you, then please consider joining us in support of the riders and register as crew. It takes a lot of people to support the riders on their journey. If you are unable to join us on the Memory Ride, the closing ceremonies are a public event and your cheering would be greatly appreciated by the riders as they end that journey. Memory Ride also offers on many opportunities to volunteer throughout the year. Please contact the Ride Office for information about volunteer. You can, memory Ride can be reached online at memoryride.org or by calling the office. We have brochures available here tonight for anyone interested. If you would like to donate but do not know any participants, please send your donation and it will be applied to any of the participants that may be struggling with fundraising. All donations are always gratefully appreciated. Each of us here tonight has been affected by or is affected by Alzheimer's disease and we can each do something to fight AD. Help us put an end to this devastating disease. Please help us end the loss of any more precious memories because no one should forget how to ride a bike. Thank you. imagine that most of you know all too well the trials and tribulations of this disease and that your wounds are as big and sore as mine are. I can only hope 
that I will say something that, that, will, that you will relate to or understand, both intellectually, emotionally, but more importantly, my hope is that what I say will touch your heart and help you to realize that you are not alone in this journey with and through Alzheimer's disease. My name is Julie Noonan Lawson, and I am the eighth child born to Julia Noonan, who had early onset Alzheimer's disease, which is the genetic form of Alzheimer's. We have lost four family members so far to this disease, and we have others on, that are on their way to being swallowed up by a merciless condition. They will lose their minds forever. I'll be sharing with you tonight about genetics and Alzheimer's disease. The genetic piece is huge and most destructive if not supported with accurate information and sustained by professionals that know and understand the whole impact of knowing and living with genetic information. Our mother and her identical twin, Agnes, were the carriers of the APP gene located on chromosome 21. This is a dominant gene, and it means that if we inherit this gene, we will, with 99% accuracy, inherit Alzheimer's disease. It took many years to find out which mutation was responsible for Alzheimer's in our family. We first looked into finding out which gene carried the mutation in our family when we first looked into finding out which gene carried the mutation in our family. It was costly, and we didn't have a doctor that was willing to help us pursue the information. Through the years, as, as we continued our work with research projects, we started participating in studies at the National Institute of Health. It was there that it became apparent the importance of knowing for sure what exactly they were dealing with. It was twofold. Once they knew for sure what disease they were dealing with, they would also know what gene was at work destroying our minds. As many of you know, there are only three known genes that cause early onset Alzheimer's disease. They are located on chromosome 1, 14, and 21. And the Alzheimer's, and the Alzheimer's Association's fact sheet about genes and Alzheimer's disease says these mutations are rare. There are only about 200 family lines in the world that are known to carry such mutations. I've made copies for anybody who would like more information on that. What does all this mean to us as a family and individuals? To be able to know whether we will lose our mind to this disorder that erases our lives or will we, we watch and care for those we love and cherish lose their mind, standing by, unable to stop the devastating effect of a disease that has already claimed so many loved ones? I stood by watching my mom and then my aunt, hoping, believing that this would be the end of Alzheimer's disease in our family. Then, when it re-entered my family, showing up first in my sister Fran, and then my sister Maureen, the hardcore truth that we were all on a journey that was going to be filled with many heartaches became our reality. We could not begin to imagine how painful this journey would be, but we knew that we needed each other, and because of who we are, we decided to be proactive. The inter intertwined emotions of genetics are beyond words, and I struggle to express the continued tossing to and fro of one emotion against another, complete opposite feelings based from the same source. How could this be? I speak not of opposing emotions that one might experience when you view a beautiful flower of joy and then of sadness that it no longer grows in your garden, but I speak of emotions that are opposed but filled with great passion because this is about life, human life, and many lives at that. 
Yet the genetic information has changed and will continue to change the direction and emotional state of family members. This is about living and dying with a mind erasing disease for many years to come. But for our family, this ability to know our genetic future has not devastated us. We have all not gone our separate ways, which is the result in some families with genetic information. But I, can, I can't say that our hearts haven't been challenged with pain. It has been a process filled with strong emotion, both positive and negative. It has been extremely painful as I have watched family members deal with the grave reality that they will face, they will live and die with Alzheimer's disease. But as quickly as I say that, I can also say that the silence of the unknown is torturous. To live one's life with the suspension of your future, your hopes, your dreams, your children's future, to suspend every possible normal event that might come to pass in your life, like wedding plans for your daughters, or living to enjoy your grandchildren, to be, to be, to be there to comfort, <coughs> hold, and advise your children when they look to you for that input, or just simply passing into the adult stage with your own children to share in events of life. The unknown has its own direction that is silent, but very real. As I have cared for, for my loved ones with Alzheimer's disease, the silent reality that this too could be my life weighed heavy in my soul. As I would try to redirect my thoughts and emotions to, to a place of neutral existence. This is a disease I have so much history with that I would wonder about myself if I too might have this disease boiling away in my brain. I worked hard to redirect my concerns, and for years I was successful. At first, my own children didn't want me to know whether I carried the mutation. That rea reality was more than any of us could handle. But as time went by, our position changed. Because we all kn know the disease very well, whenever I would overreact or forget something, we all felt a twinge of despair. And I could look in their eyes, and I could look at their faces, and I could know that they were worried. Is this behavior because of Alzheimer's disease? I also felt the same emotional pressure when I was with a sibling with Alzheimer's disease. I could see my own possible future in their lives. Then my heart would get pulled, and I would start to question my behavior all over again. Stress can make you forgetful, so compound my life with the death of two siblings, normal parental, stresses of raising children, uh, teenagers today, dealing with Alzheimer's disease in so many areas of my life. And it would be safe to say the stress level was high, and I was forgetful. In the winter spring of 2003, my family and I started genetic counseling. First me, by myself, to sort out my own thoughts and feelings. And then when I had concluded that I was going to find out for sure, I asked my girls and my husband to join me. We had many heartfelt conversations and honest exchanges. When I first approached my, my children, my oldest daughter said to me, it's your body. It doesn't matter what we think. Though I value her respect for my process, I also knew too well this in information could bear heavy results and everyone involved needed to be intellectually and emotionally ready for the outcome regardless of the result. Everyone in my family wanted to know what our future ho would hold. For my husband, what path was his life going to take emotionally and financially? For my oldest daughter in her 20s, it was more about what her future would hold. Should she be involved with someone? Should she have children? And general concerns <coughs> about living with a mom that would lose her mind. 
For my other daughters, who are in their teens, they simply wanted to know about today. Is this behavior the begin, beginning signs of AD? And for me, I wanted to know if my own thought processes were a result of stress or was I losing my mind. This was probably one of the hardest things I have ever done in my life. The conflicting emotions that rage within me were intense as I processed whether to find out or not. For me as an individual, hope is a major part of my belief system. And if I had the mutation for Alzheimer's disease, where and how could I find hope? How could I live without hope? How could I live? What tools would I use to get myself through the days? How? That was the big question, and I could find no answers. When I spoke to the genetic counselor at the National Institute of Health, he was the one that helped me to see how necessary hope is for everyone in this process, and that even my hope was suspended, as well as all of my life was suspended, waiting to see if I, I would get AD. This conversation helped me through the night, and in the morning, my husband and I found out that I did not carry the mutation that causes Alzheimer's in my family. Now, I am among those in my family that will not face this dreaded disease up close and in our own minds, but I am a survivor, and that comes with its own burdens. I have watched individuals go through the same process I just spoke about with different results. They have had challenges, find, they have had the challenges of finding their hopes, recentering with life, and finding the positive things to live for. But it has not been easy. I could safely say it has, it has for some been downright difficult, the biggest challenges of their lives. I've watched them deal with everyday life choices, and I've grieved their losses with them. But I can safely say that all are glad that they know. I have watched this disease chart the course for some individual lives, and others know what their future holds and make choices based on who they are and what they have always wanted, not on the results. There have been no two people responding to this information the same way. This disease has had profound impact on our family, challenging us in ways we have never imagined. Sometimes I stop to think about the effects on us as, as a family, and I can see that we have probably had conversations that most families have never dreamed of having. And we are closer because of it, but it has not been without pain, struggles, and diversity. Our most recent loss as a family was my dear sister Fran. We lost her in the battle against Alzheimer's disease though I would imagine most of you understand, we are relieved for her and her family that she has passed away. When Fran realized that she was going to lose her mind to Alzheimer's disease, she took what little time she had left with her mind and set forth to fighting. She started right at home with the kids' school, informing them, if I forget my kids, it's because I have early onset Alzheimer's disease. She told the orthodontic office, the bank tellers, and anyone in the community that might be affected by her forgetting. And then she reached out to the Alzheimer's community, speaking for the Alzheimer's Association to Congress, asking our politicians to put more money into research. She spoke publicly to ABC 2020. She appeared on the Lisa Gibbons show. And she was able to make her last contribution in the fight against Alzheimer's disease a year ago, December 2002, with this last PBS presentation. Fran's battle, Fran battled Alzheimer's disease for about 14 years, and in the beginning, knowing full well what her battle would be against. She used to say to me, if only I could understand how this disease works, how it goes about destroying the brain, I could then visualize it. I could 
visualize the destruction and maybe have an impact on its effect in my brain. But I don't really know any better today about Alzheimer's, dis Alzheimer's destroying the brain than I knew when mom had it. Fran would be impressed with the knowledge science has today, but I am sure she would be frustrated with the lack of a cure. Not for herself, but for her children, for her nieces and nephews who will have to face this disease. She, as my brother Malcolm has said, just find a cure, just stop the disease. Thank you for your time tonight, and may God bless you in your journey in and through Alzheimer's disease. I guess, I, I guess the other side of this is, is, yeah, we have the early form of the disease, but they, the late onset is just as devastating for a lot of families as our early. And, and it's, I guess what I want to say is the emotions I'm having, I think the people with late onset are also having similar emotions and, and difficulties. Oh, yeah. And so it's, it's, Emotions don't matter whether it don't care if it's early or late. <laughs> it's still hard to deal with. And Elaine, you know that because you deal with a lot of early stage, early onset. Early onset, I'm sorry. Thank you so much for me personally, from what I go through with my mother. Um, thank you so much. And you bring out. In, in so many people in this room um, that it just helps to hear it and for how much you've gone through it's just thank you Appreciate and I sell my autographs for five bucks <laughs> 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 wait a minute what's the number the number for the uh, the ride 508-564-5700 okay just want to say this one more time in case people uh, some other place when they hear this, what is it again? 508-564-5700. I'm going this year. All right. All right. All right. All right. On a bike? I'll be on a bike. However I do it, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I have a big wheel. Good. I have a question for any of you, all of you, um, having been in the field for 20 years and being a big advocate for early stage people and early onset people. Um, what advice do you have? There's a mix of professionals and family members, obviously. <coughs> what, what do you need from us? What do you need from us locally? What do you need from the association as a national organization um, besides a cure? I know you need a cure. So, you know, what, what do you need in the way of support and services and compassion? I think that we've that. run into we've run into continually with so far both sisters that have had the disease and actually our mother and our aunt is that it's a very difficult disease to manage in a younger patient. So care is hard to find. Mm -hmm. Oddly enough, it is hard to find because they're young and strong mm. and um, mm. and we were told because of where the disease hits our brain initially, um, there's more aggression. That's what we were told at the National Institute of Health. It's 
starts, where the brain starts to eat away at our brain, where the disease starts to eat away at our brain, there's more aggression for, because there is a lot of aggression in family members. What are you talking about? (laughs) (laughs) So, so, can you get me an Irish? (laughs) Sure, it's personality too. (laughs) I think that it's also, you know, the disease, and we have had a very hard time finding facilities to care. And actually, my sister Fran, the best place that she ended up in was a brain injury place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I just see my younger people. I, I, I think well, Butch. One of, the, one of the things that I have done is um, I have end of life issues pretty well spelled out. And um, if I become agitated, they need to medicate me. If I become aggressive, they need to medicate. They need to medicate me to keep other people and myself safe. You know, and this is the type of things that I've done ahead of time. Uh, but that's a, because I've grown up with it, I, I'm aware of these things, but it's awfully hard for families with late onset because they don't have an understanding like my family does. I think another, another thing that I, I think of when you ask that question is respect of end life choices. Yeah. Um, the battles that we've had to face or that other families of our siblings have had to face because facilities said, sure, we can do that, and then refused to. Um, Professionals really need to remove their own emotions from the care of patients. Um, Really, it's none of your business how a patient wants to go. It's only your business to make sure that they're pain-free and cared for and that's all that, that needs to be done by the medical profession. And it's a, it's a frustration for a lot of us to see that out of the goodness of a, of a medical profession's heart and their Hippocratic oath and their desire to do good that they feed and they medicate and they help. Um, Mom was given a hysterectomy four years before she died. She was already in a fetal position. There was no reason that that should have happened. But at the time, it was not acceptable that end-life choices were respected. Mm. But there are still places and doctors that can't let go of, I need to do everything that I can do for this patient. Mm. And, and it's, it's, it's more painful for family and patients to watch their family <coughs> linger such, in such a way. I think that also um, one of the things that would be helpful is in talking with um, families that have that are dealing with Alzheimer's is to address the end life Mm -hmm. instead of shying away from it and being fearful of talking about this disease that's going to kill us um, address it head on so that the person that's being affected mostly which is the person with the (coughs) disease can say what they would like and the people around them will know and it's it's a very difficult subject to talk about even with someone that's healthy, never mind talking to someone that is in the process of dying. Mm -hmm. So just a sensitivity and an encouragement to talk about those issues. Which means we need early diagnosis to involve the person with the disease. We know that. The other one, the one other thing that I can think of that when you ask what can be done, I know there's a lot of confidentiality and doctors can't share names of families that have this, if the Alzheimer's Association or somebody could pull together a database and when a family says, please give our information to another family, to just have, there's nothing that we can do for one another other than be there, but early onset does affect families differently, you know, although it's very similar to late stage or late onset, (coughs) it's different. It's different when, you know, you have children that are 20 years old that are going to watch this happen. Um, being able to connect, and, and we haven't had that resource isn't available, mm-hmm. you know, and, and um, we'd like to make that resource yes, available. Yes, you guys, uh, did everyone in your family get tested? All everybody, has, everybody has been part of the study, part of the, okay. with the exception of one. Um, did you all find out? All of us have not found out yet. Mm-hmm. How many have found out? Just you guys yet? 
Well, my sister Kathy, that died from cancer, did not find out. Okay. And uh, the autopsy was done, but the family, the children, would prefer not to know. So that's you know, their, their choice. So my brother-in-law has decided not to do that confidential. And um, so what happened is, in, in the mid-90s, we all gave our blood. And so um, the authorities know, but we don't know. You know, and, and very few people know, I'm sure, that, you know, they keep that confidential, so. So statistically, they know. Yes. They know they, statistically, and they know who has it. They say that, because I'm on a 12, mm -hmm. um, and my mother had all the problems. But I was under the impression that, um, they, you know, MRIs don't show anything, that the only thing that shows is, you know, the autopsy mm -hmm. when they mm -hmm. look at the brain after someone has already yeah. died. So I, I was under the impression that MRIs meant absolutely nothing. And I didn't know that there were blood tests now that they, I mean, could my mother have been well, tested to be, it's I mean, it all onset. symptomatic, not. Early onset is different than late. Oh, it is. Yeah. Yeah. We have a, a rare, and as Julie said in her speech, a rare genetic form, mm -hmm. which is. So they look at them completely different? Um, the, mm -hmm. the symptoms of the Thank disease you. are the same. Mm -hmm. But the disease itself and the way it progresses and ha well, the way it happens to somebody and when it happens is different. And, and maybe, Paul, do you have something you would yeah. like to say there for this? The, it's a timing issue. Uh, the chromosome 21 um, is thought with inter interacting with some of the other chromosomes to set the timing for the disease. And uh, folks with uh, early onset um, have a particular mutation in a particular place um, that causes the timing to go awry. Oh. I think we have to remember that it's, it's so easy and it's so exciting to think we can find out if we have the gene. You have to remember that the only reason our genetics was done because we could help science so much. Mm -hmm. We're willing to do that when we can help. It's expensive, very expensive to find out um, doing genetic study on a person's blood. It costs a lot of money. And so therefore, they're not doing that to everybody that has mm -hmm. symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. We just fortunately, finally, after begging medical authorities, uh, we, we got the opportunity to be of help in a study, and therefore, it, it behooved them to find out. So um, it's not gonna be easy. I mean, don't leave here tonight thinking, well, we'll just send their blood in and we'll find out. Because it's, it's, a lot. it's a lot of money. Yeah. There's a woman here. I have a question for Paul. Is <coughs> the reason, if chromosome 21 is what determines the timing, is that why the Down syndrome people develop it earlier? Down syndrome people have a triplification of chromosome 21, right. which hmm. increases the timing issue. But it's also one in 14. It's an interaction of those, those three. Mm -hmm. But I thought the Newton family said theirs was only at 21. Yeah. Yes. The APP. The APPs. And, it, and it also showed up earlier in our mother. So typically, typically, not always, <laughs> when, you, when your mother gets it, you know, we would have a parent you tend to get it about the same time. But not always, because sometimes other genetics can affect the timing of that. Um, um, I'm old. Yeah, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've had the, the disease diagnosed for quite some time now, but I haven't progressed as fast as my mother. Um, why? I, I don't know, but it's my mother's twin also got it 10 years after her, her identical twin got it mm -hmm. 10 years wow. after she got it, so. There's, there's not, nothing's 100% when you're playing with this stuff. Mm -hmm. So early on to the considered what age? 40 and below or 40 60, and below? right? Below 60. 60. That's the new age. 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60, 60
we got to get a gun, though. <laughs> I mean, uh, Mom started showing symptoms at, what, at about 36. Really about four years before us. But that's very rare. Yeah. We're on the other side. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question to, to change from genetics to the memory right. Has this idea spread to any other state besides your three states? Uh, we have contemplated that. We're trying to um, establish very strongly here in, in the New England region. Um, 2005, we are planning on doing um, local rides, smaller rides, to end at the same time in the same location as the three state ride. Um, and then as we solidify our production staff, then we will we will look at other states and other areas of doing rights. Because I have an idea um, in Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Minnesota! <laughs> it's flat. We'd love to. <laughs> okay, I'll talk to you. <laughs> we were out, Julie and I were out in Minnesota for the filming and a lot of this beginning. Yeah. It is flat. Yes. Yeah. It is flat. We'll just have to do a longer ride. <laughs> How many miles is it? 150. Two days. It's a great time. It's a sore butt and a great time. <laughs> You'll have to edit that. <laughs> well, you right? I do. I I'm do. going to this year first time. Uh, I have three or four times out of the times we've done it. Yeah, I don't I don't know. I broke my back and and my front side just weighs it down a little too much. <laughs> <laughs> it's very painful, so I just do a lot of work. <laughs> the thing that's really held us back is money in order to produce the ride. You know, oh, getting yeah. uh, advertising, getting it out there and then uh, we we're all volunteer. We do this along with our other jobs. <laughs> So it's, you know, we, we're just looking for a corporate sponsor that could make it into a different ride. They could advertise more. So it's slow, although it's successful if we've raised in seven years 575000 It's not too slow. Well, we, we'd love to see it grow faster, you know. And not for the less. amount of work, we'd like to see a million dollars a year. <laughs> yeah. and, and I don't think that that's un unreasonable. A million dollars is a lot of money, but for the amount of work that each of us has to do to put it on because it's really mm -hmm. no different to when we have right now we had last, this year we had a hundred riders and and the amount of work it takes a few more people but the planning really is the same if we have a hundred riders right. or if we have ten riders so with corporate sponsorship we could get many more riders and we would have to provide a, a paid staff at that point but with corporate sponsorship, we could, and we could make a ride happen that would bring in millions of dollars. Paul, write a check, will you? <laughs> <laughs> how are your um, two sisters, Maureen and Fran, how are their children dealing with this? Uh, they're um, struggling. On a day-to-day -day basis. They're going through counseling. Some of them are. You know, they're all handling it in their own, in their own way. Maureen's children are shortly behind myself. The oldest is about two and a half years younger than myself. And there are others who are not much further behind. They're all in their mid-30s, except for, for they're, they're all, all in their 30s, 30s now. So it's, it's time to start worrying about that. But, and they will all make these decisions, and we'll support them on making a decision whether to find out or not as the time goes on. Well, when you say find out, it's a 50-50 then? It's, a, it's yes. an absolute 50-50 oh, okay. for each of them because, because Maureen had it. Right. Um, okay. But as you know, the, the four of, uh, as the four of us have said, aside from Butch, none of our children are at risk because we, didn't, we did not carry it. Right. But have the, these nieces and nephews, or niece, yeah, that are in their 30s and have not found out, have they ended up having their own family? Are they? Some of them have. Yeah. Yes. I think it's interesting because um, we, some of them may have found out, and we don't even know that yet. Okay, we did hear that one um, one nephew that got his results about the same time John did. He does not have the 
the gene, but um, we haven't been informed, you know, it's, they're not required to tell us. Right. And then how do you tell when you have the gene? How do you go about mm -hmm. telling the extended family, do I, as one of them said, do I want to announce the next family tragedy? Mm -hmm. well, we're, we're talking about a, a lot of emotions here, yeah. and uh, we, we all know the disease well. Mm -hmm. so. it, it has affected um, the nephew that found out at the time that I found out. He was there the same day. And um, we hung out on Saturday night together. And I was going early. We made a plan that I would go early and he would go later um, so that I would be out of here so he wouldn't see me and I wouldn't see him so we wouldn't know if each other had the, had the gene. Um, and he's, what he said to me Saturday night was, if I call you and tell you I'm dating, you'll know I don't have it. <laughs> Which said to me that he's lived his life up until the age of 30 not getting serious with anyone because of the possibility of the disease. Mm -hmm. He called me and said, I'm really serious with this. I'm really serious. <laughs> <laughs> and I jumped for joy. You, you told him you were dating too, right? <laughs> no, my wife was laying next to me. <laughs> Smart move. <Yeah. laughs> And I celebrate for them when they don't have it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so when you have this counseling prior to finding out, do they give it to you afterwards too? Oh, so we could. Yeah. Well, of course we could. No, you it's, it's really up to them to get it yourself. To, yeah, yeah, individuals to find counseling to deal with their own issues once the genetics. Has, has they like finished. to know when you're going in that you have. Uh, counselor on the other side. Okay. Regardless of what your results are going to be used. It's, it's very similar in, in talking with some people. It's very similar to, um, I've talked to guys from Vietnam that have come back and their buddy next to them was killed and they came back and they had to deal with that. And so it's, it's called survivor skills. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's just it's just a process that you have to go through. It's, it's different for all of us. Um, John's survivor skills is much different than mine. I'm the youngest, so I'm I'm really removed from Butch by, you know, four siblings. And, and that makes how I feel about not having the mutation different than how John feels about it being the next youngest in that line. And maybe how Patty feels because she's escaped it. But other siblings that haven't. And, and I'm, I'm thrilled for my siblings who don't have it. I think it's great. And, and I want them to keep going on, you know. Um, because I'm, I'm doing the best I can with keeping on going on, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. I drive my wife crazy because I, I don't want to slow down. <laughs> so. yeah. I think it's great, though, that, that you can say that, and I mean, if every single one of you did have it, then how could you support the ones right. who didn't, or vice versa, you know what I mean? Yes. I mean, I just know that, you know, being a part of a big family, you know, when my mother you know, was sick with Alzheimer's. I mean, you did. I mean, it, it took its toll because my father died, and then my mother, you, she never recovered from his death. And, um, I mean, there was definite diversity. There were family meetings that we s swore and down we would never do them again because this one was mad at that one, this one, we shouldn't do this. I was the scheduler. So I was the one, okay, you have basketball on this night, you this, and, you know, taking care. But, I mean, it's just you all come together and you, you do what you need to do and you take care and I think it's great that. Well, we had to go through the process. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm just saying that I think everything, you know, there's a reason why you all don't have it. And, mm -hmm. right. and you can support you and you can say to your sister that it's okay that you that you don't have it and it's okay that I do. And, you know, I, Damn you it. Know, <laughs> but I don't know, that's just how I, how I would think it. No, that, that is the way know? that I feel. 